Um, you know, so many people have covered these critical topics. I'll be a bit redundant. I'll try to put a different spin on things. Um, so many important points for those people who are not doing these things. Um, I've obviously gone down the road of fusion uh, from the beginning because I did my first endoscopic cases when Christoph was here in Miami and Christoph pushed me and I just didn't have um, the chops to do the hard endoscopic decompressions that he does. But I, I went the way of fusion. I'll kind of show you why um, that is the case. So, so this is really the funny thing about what we do, right? It's very threatening. And uh, I remember the first time I showed an awake fusion at, I think it was at NAS in 2012. And it was a room of real, real stalwarts, like real names. And uh, some of the people really pushed back very hard. They, they weren't angry about it, but there was a look. There was the look of this obsolescence piece. And we're seeing that now finally. And this is really what drove it. I mean, seeing uh, a JoyMax meeting with about a thousand surgeons that are users um, really changed how I view this uh, in terms of what endoscopy can really, really do. So, you know, folks have talked about it now. We're working through this quarter. I'm not going to get into this uh, because they're better than me at this kind of thing. Uh, but it's it's very exciting to get to that size. Size really matters. Everybody says they do an MIS surgery, but what is the real size of your aperture uh, that you're that you're working with? So um, plug for Christoph's book. I don't know if you guys are handing out free copies. Uh, Christoph uh, gave me the privilege of being involved. This, this is his book. It says there's no bullshit in it, right? It's all real stuff. And he's right about that and, and really uh, a credit. But, you know, it's, it's asked us to re-explore this concept of Camden's triangle and going down this rabbit hole of what this triangle really means, understanding it. You've heard a lot of discussion. Chris Young just gave a great talk about this, how you access to Cambins. And this is especially important. We tried to come up with a classification scheme. Uh, Greg Basil, who's one of our young staff members here and our head of endoscopic surgery at University of Miami, this idea that there are really uh, different corridors by which you can get through Cambins with open surgery or endoscopic. And I know everybody there probably does endoscopic, but folks listening from abroad, they may not understand that Camden's triangle's medial border is defined by the traversing nerve root. And so that is for the typical T-lift or PLIF patient. That's what they're doing, but they've taken off the facet and part of the lamina, the lateral lamina, so they can enlarge Camden's triangle. But with MIS surgery, we see more of this where you've taken bone, but you don't really retract the fecal sac as much, but you still take in that bone. And so when we work natively through Cambins with this endoscopic approach, we're working through this almost theoretical space that is really much smaller and confined by the superior articular process of the facet. And you have to get smarter, just like people got smart about X-lift surgeries, about how to understand the anterior and lateral anatomy. So we try to categorize these approaches in the one, 3A, 3B, and 3C. The fusion route is 3A, which is a direct onto disc, what you would do for discography, or a fusion like this. So you're trying to stay in plane of the disc as Chris Young showed you on the last talk. Uh, usually we're treating spondylolisthesis. So, you know, in terms of, of technique, I mean, a lot, I, I saw Ray Gardaki in lab showing excellent technique. Um, let me just say that, you know, what we've done with our awake uh, endoscopic fusion system is these six pieces, of course, the endoscope, the, endos uh, the awake anesthesia, it matters what screws you use. We use Expro, really important. We use spinology. Uh, which is now on label and off label BMP because we really have a very high fusion rate, about 98% or greater fusion rate. It's probably not going to be that high if you don't use that off label, I'm not advocating or against it. So, this is what it looks like. Uh, those of you who do this know it's under an hour to do this surgery. Mohammed um, um, Abdelbar showed how people can just leave the hospital. Uh, absolutely, these are all in play for people who are interested in that. Um, like Christoph and, and Mohammed, I, I work in an academic center. We don't own a surgery center. We're not especially incentivized to do this, although this was important during COVID times and maybe very important in, in the future. And this was the first case I ever did. I know you've probably all seen this video. It's the first case I ever did. Uh, you can see I'm talking to the patient. We're going to do awake endoscopic spinal fusion with all these technologies together. And, you know, you've seen enough of this. I don't want to, I don't want to run through the video just to, to any, I'm happy to share it with anybody. It's already, I think, out there on the, on the internet, right? And this is what it looks like. This is a patient one hour after surgery. For those who are not believers, walking around the recovery room, this is a fusion, uh, one level, four screws, no narcotics. This is what it can be. Not every single patient's like that, but it can be like that. And, and uh, I'm not going to be, be, belabor the publications because, because you guys can all find that. Our sedation protocol, 
Uh, we use a combination of propofol ketamine. Uh, we don't use any narcotic. We don't use spinal. So this is uh, this is available if you want. We haven't published this out there. We are now doing uh, studies on uh, anesthetic levels of depth and all that because people are having trouble. They all say, how do I get my anesthesiologist to do this without doing a spinal? Uh, of course, part of it's your surgical technique, but a part of it's their their piece. And we find that working with the CRNAs is really critical because they got to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, so why do this? Uh, we saw Mohammed talk about this. You know, you get the best neuromonitoring. There's all these other benefits of not putting people to sleep. I think it's well understood now that there are real negative effects of general anesthesia, even though it's very powerful, not against the anesthesia. It's just, it's, it's a different way of doing things, right? So, you know, this is a patient who's a, actually a doctor giving me a thumbs up, ready for surgery. Um, I do not screen for compliance. I don't say, well, you know, a person's too anxious for this, patient's too fat. I don't really do that. Uh, the anesthesiologist will sometimes say, well, if someone has too much sleep apnea or too difficult in airway, sometimes they'll say, can we just put this person to sleep? But by and large, I'm not screening and cherry picking patients. If anything, these are the sickest people. This is from the Wall Street Journal, right? So a couple of years ago, right before COVID, you know, that people know this now, that there is a brain risk after surgery. And I'm sure a lot of the professors have patients who travel from far and wide. I think uh, Muhammad was talking about someone who came from far away in Tennessee, uh, you know, and, and people understand this now, if they're high functioning, that there are negative cognitive effects from anesthesia. And, we, and Muhammad talked about this, operating on old people with bad cardiac status, uh, EF of 11%. For grade two spondy, you can see that that's what we're doing here with pacer pads on the patient. Um, and, and, you know, fewer physiologic derangements because homeostasis, right? You remember that from medical school is maintained because the patient has homeostasis. And so, you know, the cardiac effects of anesthesia are minimized on intubation, extubation, all those effects of intubation, like right main stem intubations, vocal cords getting knocked out, atelectasis, all those things are out off the table. Temperature regulation, this is important, right? This is a, not an unimportant thing in endoscopic surgery in general, but the patient is more homeostatic. Uh, catheterization, we don't use a fully catheter, so we don't have the male urinary retention problem, which is one of the leading causes of length of stay being increased. This is a picture I like to show of someone who had an A-line put in with dissection across the arm. This lady had to have her surgery canceled. She shows me her arm every time she comes to clinic, says your surgery is great, but what about my arm, right? Because this never fully recovered. So all of these things are real concerns and expanding these people that you can treat, right? Treating more people, not because we're doing unindicated surgery, but because now we can reach people who really need us. But before we'd say, we don't want to take that risk. And, and this is a nice study out of Singapore showing that in fact, yes, these older, sicker people can benefit just as much. And should they be denied care? This is what the American healthcare system is going to have to face. Are we going to ration care? Are we going to say, well, no. Are we going to go to a two-tier system? What is really going to happen in our healthcare system? Right now, all the folks that are faculty, I know they're the pioneers, they're thinking about how are they going to continue to give access to their patients, right? Very important, right? Size doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter about endoscopic. Maybe you can't do it awake, but it doesn't matter how big the patient is. Christoph, you ever been back out of surgery because the patient was too big endoscopically? No, right? I'm going to think no. Yeah, of course not. It's ridiculous, right? Here's a lateral position BMI of 53, right? Uh, I think that's Rajiv Saigal in there who used to be at University of Washington and, uh, and, and getting uh, the results you need with that kind of approach, right? And what about the outcome? So people say, well, okay, well, that's great. But what about your outcome? So we've looked at this, right? So uh, we saw nicely how Chris talked about, Chris Young talked about the end plate preparation, right? And Tony Young used to say, I can see the pain, right? And now we're going to remove it. But getting that bony end plate ready, and you can see it here, bleeding cortical bone uh, is what you need for the high fusion rates. And indirect decompression, here you can see we've got a patient with an L4-5. Most people do like a six-level fusion on this. But we're just going to treat that one level endoscopically, distract, get indirect decompression, of course, through Wolf's Law. They'll be remodeling to open up the canal space eventually. So about 2% of our patients do need a hemilaminotomy in a delayed fashion. So it's not 0%, but it's 2%. So we've broken the MIST lift into essentially two parts now. You've made the surgery smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, which really is, is why we do MIS surgery. So we've looked at this, we've looked at our data. I, I know that Christoph yesterday was talking about data. We're gonna get into that just a touch um, in what we're doing. This is what it looks like. Again, a lot of this has been published. I'm about to publish our series of the first 400 patients uh, up to three level cases. So, you know, 
Complications, transient DRG symptoms, the really the only thing you could really hurt is the DRG. Be very aware of that. That's why we went awake in the first place, because we wanted the best neuromonitoring. We've now published on the EMG thresholds of what the DRG is. For us, the threshold's eight milliamps on direct stimulation. Uh, Spinology has a system for direct stimulation uh, that you can use in your OR, right? But it also makes you super efficient. So this is a slide I used to show when I first started as in, in my practice, when I was a young attending. In 2002, I said, there's this cost of surgery. It can be measured a lot of ways, blah, 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 blah. So 2012, I started saying, well, let's bend this cost. Let's bring it down. And this is a slide I showed in 2012. So I'm going to show you, I know Christoph uh, has a very advanced uh, health care uh, app that he's using that I, I think a lot of you guys use, which is excellent. Um, this is ours. This is Kinesiometrix. And basically, this shows two curves of two different patients, uh, 400 days before and after surgery. John Yoon helped with this. Endoscopic fusion in red, decompression, meaning microdiscectomy in blue. So this is very interesting because this shows the phenotyping of a fusion turning into the phenotype of recovery of a discectomy. This is super powerful. And this is super scary because this in the wrong hands is almost too powerful. So I'll let you think about that. So narcotic usage, this is what it looks like. The orange is the awake. The blue is my MIST live series. Uh, if you look at uh, the opiate crisis, this is not unimportant in terms of what it's meant for our country. 109,000 deaths in 2022. Uh, we will see what 2023 holds for America. Obviously, the less narcotics people take, the better in general. This is our cost data. It's really, really, really hard to get cost data. So this shows that when we do endoscopic T-lift, awake T-lift, our cost of event is 19,000. For MIS T-lift, it's 23,000. It's a 16% savings. We're making money for the hospital hand over fist. We are survivable even in the most stringent models of bundling, et cetera, et cetera. That was really our goal to survive the Affordable Care Act. And that was a big impetus for, for all of this that we are doing here. So 16% cost savings. And that's even with using the disposables for Joymax, even with using BMP, all of that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is something I like to show. It's kind of fun. Two cases, uh, the, the uh, asleep MIST lift, the awake T lift, groomed in time is 725. Prep starts 749 versus 732. I've saved myself uh, 17 minutes here because there's no intubation. Now, pr procedure starts. That's when you cut skin, 8 o'clock versus 738, there's no bovi hookup, no light handles. So I've saved myself 22 minutes. Procedure end at 1056 for MIST lift, 830 over here for awake, that's 121 minutes, I think. And then out of room, you gotta wake the patient up, 10 minutes is fast, 835. So I have 151 minutes saved on the first surgery. So I'll let the, I, you know, I know some patients listen to this, are like, why, why do you care about this? Well, I do care about it because more time on the table is more hazard for you. As long as we're doing a good job, we wanna have as little time as possible spent in the OR, in, in, in the danger zone, if you will, right? So all of that's important. Uh, there are some challenges. Uh, as I said, DRG, here's an example. Here's a, I'm sorry, this is uh, what I think Jen Shen was talking about. This is uh, early case, blowing out the end plate. We rely on indirect decompression. We're not perfect. We have mistakes. This is uh, early under series. You can see the end plate fracture there as a result. The patient had a long recovery because of that eventually fused, which was fine. Uh, so be careful about indirect depression, understand the stress strain relationship of the bone and your cages. Uh, DRG, this is, if you remember one thing from this talk, DRG, 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 getting around the DRG, understanding facet anatomy, getting in there properly, not hurting the DRG, understanding that space so you don't get DRG irritation uh, from your surgeries, right? So the most critical structure, again, is the dorsal root ganglion. That's really the only thing that you could hurt in these surgeries. So next stages, I try. I know I'm a little bit behind. Really important. Okay, so robotics, right? There's sessions on robotics. I think coming up. Uh, this shows. I think uh, the first uh, publication on this. This is the Da Vinci putting putting together a sandwich. The robot has a lot of powers that are coming. We're just seeing the first generation. Even the robots you think that are the best are still very early first generation robots. I'm not going to go show you the video. Here is a video I'll show you of using the robot for just endoscopic drilling. People are saying, well, you know, Christoph spends a lot of time teaching his fellows how to hold the endoscope. Well, the robot will hold it for you. So that'll keep you from plunging. We move the robot around to drill a laminectomy. This is an interlaminar approach. It's a little slow right now, but we can move the robot incrementally. And obviously this is going to get better and better. This is the wave of the future, clearly, so that you don't need to be quite as experienced to get the surgery done. Now, what's the next stage? So we've moved to complex endosurgeries. Uh, this is an example. I like to show this one, three-level awake T-lift, 136 minutes. 
or relatively minor deformity. Um, getting better lordosis, Jen Shen showed this, trying to get lordosis, cutting the ALL, that's coming next year. The products will be available for that. Very exciting stuff that's coming. I think a lot of people are working along these lines. Our goal is to change the MIS def uh, protocol. Uh, the protocols in terms of uh, the first MIS def, MIS def one, this is what Praveen put together versus MIS deformity two was basically about ACR and mini open PSO. So we want the next one to be endoscopic surgery for deformity will be MIS def three. And I hope that the people that are listening are, 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 are gonna move on that journey. I think everybody is headed in that direction. This is an example of what we've been doing. Uh, two left. This is for flat back, two level a lift or one level a lift, followed by endoscopic fusion above because you're not just going to do a lift perk screws for deformity and getting this shows the montage iliac screws in uh, percutaneous and then long segment fusion using the endoscope for fusion at the upper levels and getting this type of uh, improvement in lordosis with really almost no blood loss in the course of a surgery. That's leveraging a lift largely, right? Here's another case. This is very interesting. This is a person with discitis, uh, kyphosis. Uh, and you can see here, we're going to, this video just shows us getting into that space. The discitis is kind of burned out, but he's got severe degeneration and uh, instability as well as deformity. So we're aspirating. It looks like it's just going to be blood product inside of there. We're going to correct it. This is the spinology cage conforming to that, getting us good lift, getting us inner body height restoration, uh, filling in the bone that's been destroyed by the uh, infection in the past. So very interesting new vistas to get to. Uh, what if we could do you know, the ALL releases, we're doing that now. Jen Shen showed you his technique, the pie crust. We have a different technique, direct endoscopy visualization, uh, cutting the ALL. And again, the implants for this are coming out uh, in about 12 months. Uh, very exciting with build modular implants. We're going to be able to do deformities over a case of a, a series of cases rather than one huge operation, which is just too dangerous and deadly right now. Building modularized systems so that patients can, can, can take this uh, type of big surgery in a more controlled fashion. So in summary, like, you know, my hat's off to everybody there. I've, I've seen a lot of the talks today, really amazing stuff. Christoph, amazing job with this course. Uh, everybody's giving great feedback already. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's just such a great journey. And I know that in another five years, this whole world is going to change because of the people uh, in that room. So thanks again for having me. It's a real privilege and honor.